Hello and welcome to the Vermont Report on Palestine Israel. I'm Mark Hage. Our first report comes to us courtesy of Democracy Now! and its lead investigative reporter, Amy Goodman. She documents in this report the state sanctions, systematic, and pervasive use of torture in a network of Israeli prisons against Palestinian detainees. Her reporting is based on the findings of Beth Salem, Israel's leading human rights organization. In early August, Beth Salem published a report appropriately titled, Welcome to Hell. And it features interviews with 55 Palestinians who were arrested after October 7th and detained or incarcerated in Israeli prisons. These Palestinians are from the West Bank, from Gaza, and from Israel proper. Here now is Amy Goodman of Democracy Now! This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Israel is facing growing condemnation over the torture and rape of Palestinian prisoners. Israel's Channel 12 News aired shocking footage of Israeli soldiers sexually abusing a Palestinian prisoner. The video shows a group of blindfolded prisoners lying on the ground inside a prison at Sdeteman Army Base, which critics have compared to Guantanamo. Israeli guards are then seen taking one man into a corner where the soldiers encircled him and reportedly sexually assaulted him. Israel's investigation of this incident is what led a group of far-right Israeli protesters and lawmakers to break into two military bases last week in an effort to prevent the soldiers from being questioned. Meanwhile, a group of U.N. experts has warned Israel's escalating use of torture of jailed Palestinians is a crime against humanity. The experts wrote, Torture practices are irredeemably unlawful and constitute international crimes, yet form part of the modus operandi of Israel's notorious detention and torture system." Unquote. Meanwhile, the Israeli human rights group B'Tselem has published a major new report documenting how the Israeli prison system has become what B'Tselem calls a network of torture camps. I want to turn to an interview conducted by B'Tselem of Ashraf al Mutasaf, a father of five from Hebron and a wedding band manager. While detained on the morning of November 18th last year, Ashraf had prison guards storm his cell he shared with other men, claiming they were looking for a radio. One morning at six, they raided our cell, about 15 guards with a monstrous dog. Sometimes they made him attack sensitive body parts. They attacked us all, kicking us and hitting us with sticks. I was leaning against the wall behind others in the cell. They started kicking me in the neck and ear. Unfortunately, I got a very hard blow to my ear. I've completely lost my hearing on that side. I got four fractures in my back ribs, three in my chest, and fractures in my hands and other body parts. In another interview conducted by the Israeli human rights group at Salem, 50-year-old Firas Hassan, an official in the Palestinian Authority's Ministry of Youth and Sports, describes not only being beaten by prison guards while in detention, but hearing that their brutal attack is being live-streamed for Itamar Ben-Gavir, the Minister of National Security of Israel, to watch. <laughs> On November 9, 2023, two prison forces, the district unit and the initial response force, came into cell 14 we were in on wing 28. We were 10 Palestinians in the cell. The forces came in masked and beat us for 50 minutes. 
They laughed while they hit us and live streamed it all. I understand Hebrew and I heard one say, we're live streaming for Ben Gavir, directly to Ben Gavir. They beat us in various ways with their hands and feet and then brought in police dogs. After they tied our hands behind our backs and blindfolded us. Betselem also spoke to Sari Haria. He's a 53-year-old real estate lawyer and an Israeli citizen. He was arrested and detained over a Facebook post November 4th last year. In this clip, Sari describes Abdurrahman Lari, a 23-year-old man in the isolation cell next to him, screaming in pain and later being brought out in a body bag. He screamed in pain constantly, begging for the doctor. The guard would come now and then and swear at him and tell him to shut up. In the morning, the guards came to count us. One said, get up, you animal. Get up, you dog. They checked him, and the whole place went silent. Finally, the doctor said, there's nothing to be done. One of the guards said to them, my condolences, and they all started laughing. They put him in a black body bag and carried him out like trash. We're joined right now by Sarit Mekaeli, international advocacy lead for the Israeli human rights group at Salem. The group's new report is titled, Welcome to Hell, the Israeli Prison System as a Network of Torture Camps. Sarit, thanks so much for being with us. Um, just as we listen to these horrifying accounts, please lay out your findings. I think on the very fundamental level, uh, Amy, our findings look at the systemic, uh, ongoing and state-sanctioned, government-sanctioned uh, use of torture and abuse in the Israeli prison system vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians, Palestinians who Israel considers to be uh, viewed as security uh, prisoners. Now, this is something that we have uh, discussed in the past. I mean, torture and abuse of Palestinian detainees in uh, detention and interrogations have occurred. They have been documented. But the level, the degree, the scope, the scale of this phenomenon since October 7th uh, are simply unrelated to anything we've seen in the past. Um, and when we look at the way these people are treated, you showed some of the testimonies. Some of the uh, many more testimonies are actually available on our website, and we're sharing them uh, online. Um, you see that clearly this isn't the actions of any sort of rogue element of the Israeli prison system. It's a um, government-sanctioned uh, and also government-supported, government-mandated uh, uh, policy. And that's the essential conclusion that we have from all of the information that we've collected in, re in recent months. If you can talk about um, Firas, uh, who was describing um, uh, not only being beaten by uh, the uh, Israeli soldiers, um, but also the fact that this beating was being live streamed for the national security minister of uh, Israel, Itamar Ben Gavir, to watch. So I just want to clarify where. We know that the, the, the police, uh, or the, sorry, the prison guards were discussing this. Uh, certainly, we have not, uh, clar you know, we clarified in, in our communications that we don't know whether this was indeed like a literally live streamed for Itamar ben -Fir, or whether it was more about the, the, the spirit of Itamar ben -Fir, because a lot of the um, things we see on the ground today in the Israeli prison system uh, are directly related to the influence, to the spirit of Minister Ben Gvir. Uh, I think it's certainly not the case that Minister Ben Gvir is the only person responsible. Absolutely, the, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who, who gave him all of this authority, uh, is absolutely responsible and culpable for this reality. But 
the Israeli government and uh, Ben Gvir have shown again and again since October 7th, but also before October 7th, that they are hell bent, that their intention is to uh, cause this deterioration, to uh, increase uh, the pressure on Palestinian prisoners. Uh, and this was. Um, this has been done, and we saw these kinds of developments even prior to October 7th. From the beginning of the tenure of Minister Ben Gvir as Minister of National Security, he has been imposing his racist, his Kahanist agenda, both on the Israeli police, with great success, unfortunately, and also on the Israeli prison service. Um, October 7th, the, the horror, the, the crimes committed against Israelis uh, on October 7th served as a golden opportunity for Ben Gvir to continue to uh, cynically manipulate the Israeli trauma, the Israeli fear and anger in order to push forward this agenda that he has been promoting be even beforehand. So I think one of the clear things that we've seen on the ground in, and in the, in the system since October 7th was that much of this Israeli policy, at least the, um, the, the, the parts about uh, uh, starving uh, prisoners, about cramping them all together in, in, uh, in large numbers, in cells, cancelling any possibility for them to have any sort of sustenance, to buy additional food, for example. All of these policies uh, are, have been declared, they've been uh, stated by the Israeli government. They haven't hid this. Uh, ben Gvir himself has been um, on the media promoting these policies and showing, you know, having these like show visits to visit prisoners that he claims are Nukba, right, are Palestinian, are, are uh, Hamas uh, fighters from Gaza. But what we have seen again and again, based on the testimonies that we've taken, is that the Israeli policy wasn't just applied to Palestinian uh, Hamas suspects. We would argue, by the way, that this is absolutely categorically prohibited, regardless of the crimes people have been, uh, have committed. Torture and, uh, and this type of treatment is absolutely prohibited. Uh, but Israel uh, is claiming, uh, and in some cases um, uh, showing, right, to, uh, uh, performing in a way, and this is, I think, the, the incident that was described in this, is this, in this testimony seems very much an example of this. Um, not just uh, the kind of uh, actual violence and ill treatment and humiliation, but making it very, very public. And this is something that is simply chilling and is part of the really deep moral abyss that this report exposes, I think, within our society today. Um the Israeli Supreme Court considered a petition yesterday to close a desert military prison where soldiers have been accused of abusing Palestinians. Most recently, this shocking video that aired on uh, Israeli News 12, the Channel 12, uh, showing Israeli soldiers sexually abusing a Palestinian prisoner. Talk about that video and what the Supreme Court is calling for or if they've had a ruling yet. Well, I think there's a few things to unpack in this uh, in this situation. It's I, I mean again, regardless of the specifics of this individual case, B'Tselem hasn't documented it. We're not uh, familiar enough with the details. I think this is a moment within Israeli society where the old way of doing things, which involved very often these sham investigations, right, pretending that we're holding soldiers accountable for violations of Palestinian rights and investigating suspected wrongdoing, this is rejected, is being rejected by a growing maybe majority, certainly very large number of Israelis who are simply not interested in any kind of accountability because they do not believe that Palestinians deserve any rights. And this is an interesting and quite uh, disturbing uh, and very, very depressing uh, situation to experience because the, um, the power and the violence uh, released by 
the recent, for example, uh, uh, charging of uh, far-right activists into the Sdeteman uh, military base and into the Beit Lid military base isn't just going to harm, you know, the, the specific investigative bodies that we are very critical of. This is an action that is very concerted and coordinated by the Israeli far right in order to, uh, to, to scare off any type of law enforcement in Israeli society. And this is why I think it's so deeply connected to what we've seen yesterday in the High Court. There is a High Court petition against Sdeteman. It's being, it was um, presented by the Israeli, by the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. Um, and the state has as is its custom, denied that there is any wrongdoing in Sdeteman. But it's, there's also another kind of parallel development, which is that a far-right mob has actually uh, verbally uh, charged the High Court justices yesterday in the Israeli High Court and also tried to assault the lawyers acting on behalf of ACRI. And I think this is a, an excellent example of what has been happening to the gatekeepers in Israel. This is an example of why these gatekeepers, who were meant to protect against the type of abuses that we describe in this report, they have been so scared off, they've been so weakened and paralyzed after many, many years of these types of far-right and even quite centrist uh, assaults that uh, the type of reality that we exposed in the report is allowed to go um, pretty much uh, on as Minister Ben Gvir pleases with very little resistance from the High Court, the, the other courts, uh, from the Attorney General. Now, certainly we have had, we, and we're still extremely critical of these uh, institutions, of the Israeli court system, of the Israeli uh, um, uh, Attorney General, but we do expect them to stand up to this type of um, abuse to this type of official torture. And I think one of the reasons why Ben Gvir has been so successful in imposing his own agenda, his racist, Kahanist agenda, is this weakness, the, the um, cowering of the gatekeepers uh, that have been weakened for so many years. And can you talk about the protests that took place um, in the last days, trying to prevent the Israeli soldiers or police from being questioned about the sexual assault or the rape of a Palestinian prisoner? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I should also maybe open this with with the one point of light in the current reality, which is that since the, the publication of B'Tselem's report, and also since the publication and the exposure of the story about these really horrific suspicions in Steteman, um, the la there's, there's been a very strong voice coming from Israelis who are categorically oppose this. Not necessarily Israelis who are absolutely with, with B'Tselem on everything, mainstream Israelis who um, know, who understand that if you are a country that claims you're a democracy, of course, we would take great issue with this, then you cannot simply abuse people because you suspect them or because you, you've accused them and even because you've convicted them of perpetrating the, the most horrific crimes. This is simply unacceptable. And people are saying this very openly in our society today. These might not be the majority of Israelis, but it's very heartening to hear these voices again and again, as I said, also in response to, to B'Tselem's report. But the story itself, the reason it got such prominent prominence is because it really is... Um, it's something that one did not expect to see uh, up until really the, the recent period. And, and I'm saying that even though, you know, as I said, B'Tselem's report also uh, revealed additional cases of suspected sexual and gender-based abuse. The story uh, of the suspicions of sexual abuse by soldiers in Steteman um, has generated a mass public outcry, but it's also generated um, a mass response by proponents of the far right, of the Khanist movement in Israel, who simply do not want any kind of action by Israeli soldiers against Palestinians 
to be subject of any sort of accountability process. I mean, that's the whole point. From their perspective, they would like to have a completely um, a, a open a field in terms of what they could do to Palestinians, and this is both for soldiers and settlers. And anyone who tries to impose any, even the, the most rudimentary, the most basic uh, uh, level of accountability is attacked as an enemy of the state, as a traitor. And this brings us into a quite an absurd situation where uh, bodies that we are, as I said, are extremely critical of, for example, the state attorney's office and also the military advocate general's office, are now coming under fire not for what we would argue is the correct uh, reason, the fact that they have enabled Israel to allow, to, to allow the army and soldiers uh, on the ground to use totally disproportionate force against Palestinians. They've enabled almost everything that Israel has been doing in Gaza in recent months, the mass killings, the, the um, starvation, the, uh, the horrific things we have done in, in Gaza. Um, this is not what the far right is criticizing these institutions for. The, cri the criticism is coming um, when in the very, very rare cases where there is an, an occasional investigation when the Israeli investigative bodies simply don't have any other choice. I'm assuming, I, I'm, I'm, I'm only speculating, right? But the fact that there is a CCTV footage of this alleges, alleged assault and the fact that the story has become so prominent and the possibility of an internal whistleblower inside who reported this uh, have left the authorities really with no option other than to conduct this investigation. Um, certainly many other cases and, and the broad policy is not investigated, but they are still attacked by the right for this tiny foray into uh, accountability. I want to go to yesterday's briefing at the U.S. State Department, where Matthew Miller is questioned about this issue. This is the reporter Rabia Iklauturan. Going back to Israel, uh, Israeli media today released uh, a video showing Israeli soldiers raping a Palestinian detainee at Sedi Taman detention camp. Uh, the footage was very disturbing. Uh, you, I know you have commented on the reports about this detention center before, but the, we have now we now have a new evidence, which is video. Have you seen that video? And do you have anything to say on that? And also the reports of you know rape yeah. in Israeli prisons. So we have seen the video and reports of sexual abuse uh, of detainees are horrific. They ought to be investigated fully by the government of Israel, by the IDF. Um, prisoners need to be treated. Uh, pr prisoners' human rights need to be respected in all cases. And when there are alleged violations, the government of Israel needs to take steps to investigate those who are alleged to have committed abuses and, if appropriate, hold them accountable. And actually, this is not the first rape incident we have been hearing about Israeli prisons and Israeli human rights group. Beth Salem on Monday released a report saying that Sedetamen is only tip of the iceberg and that, you know, Israeli detention centers turned into a network of torture camps for Palestinian Palestinians. It reports cited testimonies from 55 Palestinian detainees. So uh, I know Israelis uh, are investigating this, but would you support an inves independent investigation into those allegations? So I would have to look at what the specific uh, in independent investigation people are calling for um, and pass judgment uh, on the merits. But look, there ought to be zero tolerance for sexual abuse, rape of any detainee, period. So that's the State Department spokesperson, Matthew Miller. Um, Sadit Makhaili, if you could talk about the significance of uh, what he is saying and what you are demanding at this point as the international advocacy lead for the Israeli human rights group at Salem. Yes, um, Amy. Well, I think the most important thing to clarify in terms of our response to this is that it's, Israel is not going to hold an investigation into the um, 
conduct and into the policies uh, in its detention centers for the pure reason, for the obvious reasons, that these are policies. They're not the actions of rogue elements, as I said. They're not the actions of individuals who are going against the grain. They're dictated by the management of the Israeli prison system and by the government. They are supported by these, uh, these um, uh, bodies. And therefore, the only options for investigations are individual cases that are either so egregious that it would be impossible for the authorities to ignore them because of international pressure, or in cases where there is some sort of uh, documentation. And that is generally, I think, uh, when you look at Israeli investigations, that is generally the way the Israeli authorities work. The small, isolated, token investigations cover up for broader policies. And in this specific case, I think, from our perspective, we have a not not appealed, we've not requested uh, Israeli investigations. B, we do not expect any Israeli investigations to fundamentally alter the situation. What we do expect is the international community to take action. And in the report, we've appealed to all nations and also to all relevant ins international institutions to look into the situation, to make it a to, to make it stop. Um, specifically, we've also appealed to the International Criminal Court because these offenses that we uh, list in our reports are uh, war crimes. They uh, also, we would argue, reach the magnitude of crimes against humanities. And this is the um, responsibility of the international community, including the United States government, to address. It's not just an intra-Israeli issue. Certainly, the Israeli government, in its current uh, standing, I mean, it's, it's pretty blatantly obvious that if the Israeli government is not able to hold an investigation into such serious allegations of horrific abuse that uh, without um, a mob of uh, right-wing uh, fanatics rushing, storming into two military bases, then it's blatant that Israel isn't going to be able, to, willing or able to address this broader policy of, uh, of torture, you know, by order, essentially, in, against Palestinians since October 7th. We're going to turn our, our attention now in our second report to the West Bank, and in particular to the city of Hebron. Hebron is the largest city in the West Bank. 40,000 Palestinians live there, as do 800 Jewish settlers, ultra-nationalist Jewish settlers, who have colonized parts of the city in violation of international law. Israel has deployed in Hebron a very extensive and humiliating and repressive system of facial recognition and surveillance. They codename it the Wolf Pack. This program, or this report, was produced by The Listening Post, Al Jazeera's award-winning program on the media. This program, too, like our first report, is detailed and it's graphic. <laughs> Hebron, the occupied West Bank. The chatter on a soldier's radio tells us we're being watched. Hebron is a place of religious significance, which makes it a magnet for some of Israel's most extreme settlers. Jewish communities who've illegally taken over Palestinian homes. But what's unique about Hebron, unlike any other Palestinian city, is that the settlers are here in the heart of the city. <laughs> Today is the Jewish holiday Puri, and the settlers are celebrating arm in arm with Israeli soldiers. <laughs> Palestinians in Hebron are some of the most heavily monitored and controlled people on the planet. In the military surveillance laboratory that is the occupied territories, Hebron is ground zero. <laughs> The 
Tehran is the West Bank's largest city, and it's being hollowed out from within. The Israeli military enforces a policy of separation here. The city was divided into two sections in 1997, H1, where the Palestinian Authority has nominal control, and H2, which is under full Israeli control. Israel's authority in H2 is designed to protect 800 settlers living here illegally, according to international law, amongst around 40,000 Palestinians. One of those settlers happens to be Itamar Ben-Gavir, who has been convicted of inciting anti-Arab racism and supporting a terrorist group. He is now Israel's Minister of National Security. To safeguard the settlers, Hebron's sacred old city is under military lockdown. Some parts of H2 have been designated sterile, that's the official term, areas where Palestinians are forbidden. Over the years, the locals have seen the environment around them transformed, inch by inch, house by house, checkpoint by checkpoint. Hebron is full of what the Israeli military likes to call friction, that lends itself to many new ways to innovate technologies that promise to reduce the so-called friction and make Israel's occupation more humanitarian for Palestinians. This is what the Israeli military claims. The streets are covered in CCTV cameras, in facial recognition cameras, that give the Israeli military and the intelligence forces a full 24-7 and encompassing view of Palestinian life in the city. I think the best word for it is carceral. The feeling that prison is not within a bounded space, but it follows you wherever you go, into the city's streets, in your home, into your bedroom, and that there's no escaping it. Across the West Bank, Palestinians are experiencing an explosion of military and settler violence. In one week in February, the Israeli military raided the city of Nablus, killing 11 people. A few days later, Palestinian gunmen shot and killed two settlers in Hawara. Hundreds of settlers then marched into the town, escorted and protected by Israeli soldiers, and indulged in an hours-long rampage. By sunrise, hundreds of vehicles, homes and shops had been torched. Over the last five years, the number of settler attacks against Palestinians has risen by almost 200%. In Hebron, they happen almost every day. The Israeli military likes to call Hebron a smart city. It's a euphemism for the elaborate system of surveillance and facial recognition they are operating here on Palestinians. If we count how many cameras we have here, how many cameras we can see? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cameras. Rizat al Karaki lives in H2. He walked me through how the cameras and checkpoints shape his everyday routine. We have 22 Israeli checkpoints like as, as the one you see. What you have to know that this checkpoint recognizes me even before I get into the checkpoint. Sometimes the soldier tell me, is that, give me your ID. He knows my name already. They know that I'm crossing the checkpoint 10 times per day, but each time they have to check my body to let me get into my, to my, to my house. Not only that, Palestinians are levels for them, which is red, yellow, and green. If you are Palestinian and you have been arrested by the army, you might be in the, in the, in the red level. For example, if you are known to them and they know you resist the occupation, you might be like, you know, in the yellow. Sometime when I want to cross the checkpoint, the soldier can keep me three hours for no reason. This is the Israeli law. So if they want to kill your day, they can easily do it. They can keep you at the checkpoint for three hours. After that, nothing will happen. They will not be accountable at all.
It's something you hear across Hebron, an awareness that the all-seeing gaze of the city's network of cameras are designed to protect the settlers, not Palestinians. It's not just the density of cameras in Palestinian neighborhoods that gives it away. It's the direction they face, often inwards towards people's homes, invading their most intimate spaces. Um Tamer lives in a neighborhood just outside the old city. Two years ago, Israeli soldiers forced their way into her home and turned her roof into a surveillance post. <laughs> لانه الضغط علينا وبنحس حالنا مش في بيوتنا في الشارع يعني احنا ضيوفنا ما بيجزرونا العيد لما يصير العيد ما بيجوا بخافوا يجوا اهلي على بيتي زي ما انت شايف الضغط علينا من كل الشقات المستوطنين من شقه والكاميرات من شقه يعني وين ما اروح في تل الرماده Testimonials from former Israeli soldiers who've spoken out about their experiences in Hebron, along with an investigation by Amnesty International, have given us a more complete picture of the various systems of surveillance in use and how invasive they are. Israeli authorities are trying to collate and create a database exclusively consisting of Palestinian faces. So the idea is that when you're arriving at the checkpoint, if that information exists on you, such as who is related to you, have you been here before, are you due to be taken in for detention or questioning, that is flagged on the system and a soldier is able to decide whether you can pass or not. They can no longer count on the soldier perhaps recognizing them or knowing them because it's a computer system into which they have been conscripted without their knowledge or without their consent. They now have to be processed through a machine learning algorithm before they get to live their lives, whether it's by getting to access education, uh, work or medical services. That's now governed by this AI system. Artificial intelligence has created what feels like a digitally mediated prison in Hebron. The military recently installed this autonomous weapon, a so-called smart shooter. It's powered by AI, which means it can shoot without human intervention. Amnesty has also documented the use of something called anomalies detection sensors and algorithms that flag the presence of individuals or objects that the Israeli military would consider out of the ordinary. In addition, soldiers use a number of overlapping programs that collate information on Palestinians to monitor and govern their movement. The first previously unreported system is Red Wolf, that's the one used at permanent checkpoints, where Palestinians are biometrically registered and assessed against information held on them. Soldiers teach Red Wolf by pairing new faces with IDs and other biographical information. Then there's Blue Wolf, a facial recognition app Israeli forces use in the field, on raids or at temporary checkpoints, to capture photos of Palestinians. The third system is White Wolf, an app for settlers, allowing them to check if Palestinian workers have the correct permits. It gives the settlers access to confidential government data. Connecting all of this is Wolfpack, a database that aims to build a profile of every Palestinian in the West Bank, including information like a person's name, where they live, their family members, car license plates, and whether they are wanted or not. According to testimonies from veterans, Israeli soldiers are even incentivized to compete with one another over who can collect the most data and photos of Palestinians. It's just one of the ways the occupation here in Hebron is being gamified. This creates an idea that Palestinians are just um, objects out there waiting to be photographed and that may help your unit to reap some form of reward, but is ultimately leading to dehumanization of an entire racialized group. 
The Israeli military refuses to confirm its use of facial recognition. But in addition to the testimonials gathered by veterans group Breaking the Silence, we also have a leaked training video for Blue Wolf. So it says here soldiers can identify a Palestinian in three ways, typing their ID number, facial recognition, or a photo of their ID. This is interesting. Soldiers can search for people using things like a car's plate number, but they can also attach information about Palestinians to their profile. So here it instructs the soldier to take a photo not just of the driver's ID, but all the passengers too. And when you look at this video, you can see why soldiers have dubbed Blue Wolf a secret Facebook for Palestinians. Blue Wolf enhances the military's ability to carry out what it calls mapping raids, when soldiers invade Palestinian homes to gather intelligence. Soldiers say it's part of a practice of making their presence felt. This raid on a home in Hebron shows what Israeli mapping of Palestinian communities looks like. Around a dozen children, still half asleep, forced to line up to have their photos taken illegally by soldiers. Say cheese. Cheese. I don't think there's any point in history in which the creation of a database consisting exclusively of one ethnic or racialized group uh, has ever led to any good outcome. We are dealing with something that we have recognized as apartheid. And in this context, the creation of a database exclusively for Palestinians to stop them from entering particular spaces, to stop them from being able to live fulfilling lives, to stop them from being able to access family and medical services. That itself is sort of re-entrenching the form of apartheid that we've been witnessing over many decades. It's creating a sort of a digital racial hierarchy. Hebron is a microcosm, one of the most intense expressions of Israeli apartheid in the West Bank. Managing the occupation of millions of people over more than five decades is a vast and costly enterprise that relies on dominance and intelligence gathering. According to one former general, Israel has become the world champions of occupation, turning it, in his words, into an art form. Surveillance is really the occupation's bread and butter. In the mind of Israeli military leadership, Palestinians across the West Bank and East Jerusalem present a security threat to an expanding settler movement. And so to contain this so-called security threat, as they put it, the army needs ever more advanced surveillance technologies to control a population. This is part and parcel of the occupation's tactics of control. The history of surveilling Palestinians so as to control them goes back more than 100 years to the days of British rule. Britain's colonial project was dependent on intensive surveillance and intelligence gathering. These documents, classified as very secret, are from 1917, the year Britain first occupied Palestine. They are handbooks on Palestinian personalities, produced by a British intelligence unit called the Arab Bureau. They were designed to give officials insights on who was considered intelligent, pro-British, or easily susceptible to foreign influence. From 1920 onwards, British Mandate authorities collected information on every facet of Palestinian life. Many of these strategies were adopted by, and in some cases taught to, Jewish paramilitary groups in Palestine like the Haganah. They determine, you know, how many men of fighting age lived in each town. They'd map out the topography so they could inform their own battle strategy and they created this vast index of all the Palestinian villages that was called the Village Files. The Village Files were a comprehensive survey of hundreds of Palestinian villages in the 1940s, produced by the Haganah. 
They included information on Mukhtars, village leaders, on which villages were likely to resist and those that were poorly defended. The Haganah also conducted aerial surveillance, taking pictures they turned into highly accurate battle maps. And they recruited Jewish operatives with Middle Eastern features, known as Mustaravim, who were planted in Arab towns and villages as spies. These colonial intelligence gathering operations would prove instrumental in the Nakba, the catastrophe in 1948, when many of the villages infiltrated were destroyed and at least 750,000 Palestinians were expelled from their homes. All of that kind of cataloging and categorizing and data collection intrinsic to colonial rule laid the foundation for Israel's um, own establishment of a quite colonial bureaucracy. In the years immediately following statehood, you know, this entailed deploying police forces and tapping into radio signals and tapping into phone calls to then developing newer technologies that could intercept emails and text messages and then spyware, CCTV cameras, biometrics. And so at every step of the way, you see technology not only standing in for these more analog practices, but intensifying them. The surveillance being conducted by the Israeli military is only one half of the story. Palestinians know there are two systems that watch over them. We have one for the soldiers and one for the settlers. The settlers who are living here in Hebron, they have their own security camera system. It's not connected to the army. For me, settlers has power more than the military itself. Usually the settlers give order to the soldier, not to the opposite. At this moment, I felt that we are facing settlers by ourselves. No one is here to protect us from those people. Throughout the occupied West Bank, illegal settlements dominate the hilltops, and some of the security systems are operated by the settlers themselves. We visited the highly surveilled Tapuach Junction, in the northern West Bank and received a special welcome Hello. from the Israeli military. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? In areas like this, it can be difficult to tell which cameras belong to the military and which are run by settlers. We know about the existence of settler cameras at this junction installed far beyond the boundaries of the settlements because of who funded them. Not the Israeli state, but an American organization called the One Israel Fund. The settler organizations have really deep pockets, uh, predominantly in North America. So the One Israel Fund is a really good example of this. They're an organization that was set up in the 90s to transfer money from the United States to settlements in the West Bank. Just look at it. We can go up with the drone, see the whole area, search down the terrace in the area. And the One Israel Fund has recently, you know, sent drones with infrared cameras that settlers will use to monitor Palestinian villages. There's reports of settlers using those drones to follow farmers as they take their flocks to eat and pasture and scare away goats and totally disrupt Palestinians' own ability to make money and make a living off of their livestock. Recently, the One Israel Fund has sold cameras to settlements that they're putting up in highly trafficked junctions across the West Bank. So the fact that the settlements can put up their own cameras far away from their own jurisdiction and use that information to bolster their own security apparatus just demonstrates how much the Israeli military is collaborating with settlements and using settlers as a way to really outsource the occupation to other forms of policing that are subjected to even less regulation and oversight than the Israeli military is. We asked the Israeli military for an interview on their use of surveillance in the occupied territories, but they declined. They did tell us, however, as part of the fight against terrorism and the efforts to improve the quality of life for the Palestinian population. The IDF conducts routine security operations. Naturally, we cannot comment on the IDF's operational capabilities in this context. 
With the Israeli military unable or unwilling to speak, we got in touch with a former Israeli general with experience in the West Bank. He spoke with us on the condition that we hide his identity. When you collect a lot of data, you can accurately control the human terrain. You need a lot of intel in order to counter terrorism. And it enables you to do so while you separate between the bad guys and the majority of the population. This is the main rationale. And there is a lot of tension between basic human rights or privacy and kind of military occupation. Definitely, in some places like Hebron, there is a huge complexity because of Jewish settlements that are embedded in a Palestinian city. I'm glad you mentioned Hebron. We saw cameras there that looked directly into people's homes, into their bedrooms. These are, by design, technologies of mass surveillance. They target everyone. If counterterrorism is the rationale, as you put it, that's certainly not how it's actually being used. It's more about control of Palestinians, is it not? Actually, I'm not very familiar with the situation on the ground, so I cannot comment on that. But as an Israeli citizen, I'm not satisfied with the situation there. There are a lot of human rights violations because of this complex situation. But I can agree that from what you describe, it's also a question of more police, law and order, and controlling them than fighting terrorism. But it definitely helps with terrorism as well. The Israeli military says AI-driven surveillance will deliver a frictionless occupation, one that is supposedly more benign. However, these experimental technologies have also allowed Israel to covertly deepen its control over Palestinians, entrenching a form of apartheid, but doing so invisibly. We often hear about how advanced Israeli security systems and surveillance technologies are and how they'll deliver a more humane and frictionless occupation. But I think what falls out of that narrative is the really invasive and dehumanizing aspects of surveillance that upend Palestinians' life day after day. To feel as if your every movement, what you say on and offline, and what you're maybe even thinking is being documented and monitored by an occupying army makes life quite unbearable under occupation. On the second episode of this special edition of The Listening Post, how spyware is being used to target human rights defenders, allowing the infiltrators to falsify evidence. The intention is to actually stop us from channeling the information that we document to different entities around the world that could actually hold uh, the Israeli perpetrators accountable. The elite Israeli intelligence unit responsible for spying on Palestinians and blackmailing them into cooperation. You always look for weaknesses. People with psychological difficulties or trust issues, stuff like that. Obviously, once you get that, you put the person at double the risk because now he's a traitor. And Jerusalem. <laughs> where there is nowhere to hide for Palestinians. Our final report comes to us courtesy of the United Nations and Dawn News. Recently, Yuli Novak, a human rights defender with Beth Salem, the Israeli human rights organization I mentioned previously, was invited to speak to the United Nations Security Council. And in her remarks, she makes clear that Israel's ongoing genocide in Gaza, its ethnic cleansing and military violence in the West Bank, these are not solely for the purpose of vengeance, although that is certainly in play. But they are, as she makes abundantly clear, for the purpose of cementing Jewish supremacy, Jewish domination over all the land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Here now is Yuli Novak of Beth Salem. Thank you. Members of the Security Council, it is an honor to address the Security Council today and I thank the Slovenian presidency for the invitation to talk to you about the state of human rights in Israel-Palestine. On Sunday, we woke up to the news that six Israeli hostages were executed by Hamas as Israeli forces came close. Another six, 
added to the tens of thousands of people in this land who should not have died over the past year. During this week, hundreds of thousands of Israelis have taken to the streets. They feel angry, desperate, and betrayed by their government. They have understood that the Israeli government does not want to retain the hostages in a deal, but to continue the war indefinitely. To understand the Israeli government's criminal conduct over the last 11 months, you, must, you, you have to understand the overall goal of this regime. Since Israel was founded, its guiding logic has been to promote Jewish supremacy over the entire territory under its control. The current government's guidelines state that, quote, the Jewish people have an exclusive and unquestionable right to all parts of the land of Israel. In the criminal Hamas-led attack on October 7th, 1,200 Israelis were killed and 250 taken hostages. Since that day, I and every Israeli I know have been living in deep fear. Our government is cynically exploiting our collective trauma to violently advance its project of cementing Israel control over the entire land. To do that, it is waging war on the entire Palestinian people, committing war crimes almost daily. In Gaza, this has taken the form of starvation, killing and destruction on an unprecedented scale. This goes beyond, beyond revenge. Israel is using the opportunity to promote an ideological agenda, making Gaza inhabitable. As this council has been informed repeatedly, a vast part of Gaza's homes and infrastructures have been completely destroyed. By driving Palestinians out of entire areas and displacing millions, Israel is laying the groundwork for long-term control of Gaza that could lead to re-establishing Israeli settlements there. In the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the government is exploiting the circumstances to create irreversible changes. Since October, Israeli forces have killed 640 Palestinians there, including at least 140 minors. Settlers are attacking Palestinians and carrying out pogroms in broad daylight with support of the from the government. They have so far managed to drive 19 Palestinian community out of their homes. And recently, the military uh, launched a huge operation to damage infrastructures that serves hundreds of thousands of people in the Northern West Bank. The international community did not stop Israel's criminal policy of massive harm to civilians in Gaza. Now, this cruel policy is spilling over into the West Bank. The war on Palestinians is also happening inside prisons. Since October, Israel has arrested thousands of Palestinians and held them in inhumane conditions. Last month, we at B'Tselem published a report called Welcome to Hell. It shows a shocking pattern of abuse that amounts to torture. The government of Israel has used the war to turn Israeli prisons into a network of torture camps for Palestinians. This violence is possible because Israel has enjoyed impunity for decades. As long as this impunity continues, the killing and destruction will continue and expand, and fear will continue to continue to rule the land. The international community has failed its duty to protect civilians. Four UN Security Council resolutions on the Gaza conflict did not lead to a lasting ceasefire or free the hostages. The risk of regional escalation has grown. Diplomatic efforts did not stop the mass killing of civilians and the humanitarian disaster in Gaza. The Council must acknowledge this failure and take effective action to compel Israel and Hamas to immediately and permanently cease all hostilities. But de-escalation is only the first step. It is time for the Council to address the opinion of the International Court of Justice on the illegality of Israel's entire occupation and settlement project. Every day that this Council does not act on the Court's call to end the occupation and apartheid is another day you are abandoning us, the people of this land. 
were suffering and dying in tens of thousands needlessly under a cruel and unjust apartheid regime. Thank you. That's our report. As always, thank you for watching. I'm Mark Hage. We'll see you soon.